coming up today on The Fit Mess. Take a moment and picture yourself. It can be one year from now. Where do you want to be living? How do you want to be showing up? What job are you doing? Like give yourself a picture of you in that moment. And then I actually want you to go, okay, what's the first next step? That's Leslie Logan. She's a certified Pilates and mindset coach and host of the Be It Till You See It podcast. Today, we'll talk with her about the small steps you can take today to be a better version of you tomorrow. Zach, one of the things we like to talk about on the show is the idea of not comparing yourself to other people because there's someone's always got baggage. They've always got their stuff. There's, it's just not a good idea to compare yourself to others. But it can be helpful to compare yourself to you yesterday so that you can see the progress you've made, the things you've done to get to where you are today, and to appreciate how far you've come. There is one other comparison that can be helpful, and it's the version of you tomorrow and the things that that person is doing to be successful and, and to have the things that they want to have. And you can learn the lessons from that person by imagining how they live their life. What are the things that they do every day? Do they go to the gym every day? Did they eat the things that they wanted to eat that day? Did they get enough water? Did they go to bed on time? All those things that you know of the, that better version of you would do. And to start implementing them sort of one at a time in really small ways to become that person. I think in some, I think there are times when that can be a helpful comparison to bring to your life. I generally agree with that. I definitely agree with the comparing yourself to yourself yesterday, right? Whenever I compare myself to somebody else, they had a different life. They had a different childhood. They had a different everything. But when you're comparing yourself to yourself, it's apples and apples. Like it is the same baggage day for day that, mm -hmm. you know, that you carried around. So I really love that fact mm -hmm. that like what I am today in comparison to what I was yesterday is different, even though like I had all that shit that happened to me. Yeah. But I agree, like going forward, sometimes you just have to be that person, your future self already and imagine what they're doing or what they would do and how they would do it and just take it on and do it and become that person. Like you're, you're the guy who you were the weird guy who rode his bike to work every day. <laughs> I was the weird guy who quit smoking. I still remember like envisioning myself quitting smoking and like being the guy who doesn't smoke. Mm -hmm. And it made me sad. The withdrawal of nicotine like kicked in yeah. immediately. And like, it made me sad, made me really unhappy, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to be that guy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be that guy. Yeah. There's a lot of things like that, that my therapist, actually, I was sharing this analogy with him once about the idea of imagining the person you want to become and taking the, the steps that that person would take. And he was quick to point out that person and you are the same person. You have the mm -hmm. ability to do all of that stuff right now. And I agree with him. But I also know that if I did all of the things that the tomorrow version of me needs to do to be happy, I would quit after two weeks because I'd be overwhelmed. It would be too much of a life change to take on at once. And, and it would be self-defeating. So you're saying small steps, small steps. It's something that we talk about all the time. Just take those tiny baby steps, <laughs> add one thing at a time for a little while until it becomes habit and then add another one and keep going and keep going and keep going. Well, if it's that simple, I've been doing it wrong the whole time. Yeah. You just, you just eat the whole elephant in one bite. I try to. And then that usually involves some pain and tears and crying and things like that. And, and then I, and then I slim down my diet, well, whether I'm slimming my diet or not slimming my diet, I can't myself just with my lifestyle and everything that's going on. I have a lot of trouble getting all of my nutrients from the food that I eat. And so I need a supplement. I need something that's good for me and healthy. And that's why I take athletic greens. It's packed with 75 high quality vitamins and minerals. It works with any diet plan and it tastes great. And for less than three bucks a day, you're investing in your health for a lot less than your cabinet full of vitamins. So reclaim your health now with convenient daily nutrition. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com forward slash fit mess. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash fit mess to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. You can also find that link on our website, thefitmess.com. All right, our guest today is Leslie Logan. She's a certified Pilates and mindset coach and host of the Be It Till You See It podcast. And that's where we started the conversation. What does it mean to her to be it till you see it? When I think of be it till you see it, first of all, I actually didn't know this is something I was doing already in life, but I was getting a question 
how are you so confident? You do so many things. Like, I just wish I could be as confident as you. And I was like, I am like scared to death. Like, I, <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. What are right. you, what are you seeing? And so I started to have to like, take like a bird's eye view of like, how is doing life? How is making decisions? Like what was going on in that process? And what I discovered is that in everything I was doing that they thought I was so confident in that, like just doing the thing, I was acting like the person who knew what they were doing. <laughs> In those right? moments. So be it till you see it is not like fake it till you make it all. It's like a more positive version of that. But mm -hmm. there's a lot that changes in your brain and how you show up when you are almost playing the role of the person that you believe could do the thing you want to do instead of waiting until the thing happens and then you're going to step up. And let me just say, like, think about if you want to be a speaker, right? Like you want to speak on stage and you want to be like Oprah and you want to speak on stage. Do you really want to like, you're not going to speak until it's 30,000 people in the audience? No right. way. <laughs> That's going to scare the hell out of you. Right. But like you get five people at a coffee shop that you're speaking in front of, you can act as if someone who, who does speak to 30,000 people in that room. And first of all, you're going to touch all five of those people. They're going to feel so special. And then you're going to start to see the room fill and fill with more people because you are creating that space and you're acting like the person who can do that versus just waiting until someone deems you ready. And then you're not going to feel ready. You're going to feel like an imposter. We, we waste so much time waiting for someone else to validate that for us, don't we? Yeah. Oh, so much. And like, I don't know. Well, here's the thing. I, I mean, I think we can go, go back to the way everyone's educated. Everyone's raised. We're all just waiting for the promotion. We're waiting for the big guy up top to like notice you and say, you, you're doing a great job. But the reality is, is everyone's so busy and everyone's so involved with themselves that they are not thinking about you. And so they mm -hmm. might be thinking in their head, like, oh, that person's really great, but they're not actually telling you that. And you waiting for someone to say you're ready is actually like you could wait your whole life for that. And that will, it probably will never happen. But if you can, you or take yourself and go, who is it that I want to be? Who, what would that person do? How does that person make decisions? Then you start to take on that role. You will start to show up in that say, if you want to be a millionaire, well, then how does a millionaire get ready for the day? Like mm -hmm. you don't have to like actually have the Mercedes Benz and have the dream house yet, but you can go, does a millionaire hit snooze 17 right. times? Does right. a millionaire yell at the dog? Does a millionaire leave dishes in the sink? Like what does a millionaire do in their morning routine? You can start to have a millionaire's routine right now. You, If you want to be someone who's like super healthy and you're like, well, when I lose 20 pounds, then I'll do this. Okay. The person that's you, that's lost the weight that you want to do. How do they eat breakfast? How, what do they do in their day? How do they structure it? You can start to have that life today just by being it till you see it. I think that's so interesting too, because combining those two ideas where you're waiting for validation from someone else to be the person that you want to be. But somehow by taking that person out of your own head and sort of, and putting them next to you, somehow that person has more value than the person that you are, right? Like you can easily go, Oh, well, well that guy wouldn't walk by this basket of laundry and just let it sit there piled up. That guy would throw a load in and then he would go back to work or whatever it is that he's doing. But when it's me, when I put it mm -hmm. on me, I'm like, oh God, that just put in the, that's good. I got to carve out an hour and a half to load up that washing machine. I don't, I can't do that. It's too much for me right now. There's just mm -hmm. something about taking that identity and not, not completely removing yourself, but, but setting it as a goal that allows you to sort of believe in your ability to become that person. 100%. And also like, I think we've told ourselves, we've sold ourselves stories about who we are, that so maybe they're not even what you said. Maybe it's somebody in your life, your parent, your grandparent, maybe they said something offhand comment when you're five years old, but it's somehow stuck with you. And it's just like taking up space in that brain rent free. And it's just like on, on a loop that you play, like maybe, maybe you didn't do the laundry correctly when you were little. And so actually, instead of you thinking it's going to take an hour and a half to do laundry, you just don't think you're good enough to do laundry because right. you, like put the colors with the whites one day and like everything came out pink. Right. So like, it's interesting what we grew up with that we keep with us. that tells a story. So then we see someone else and then we tell a different story about them. We're like, their life is easy. They have it all together. And so it's like, okay, great. If that's what you think, how are they doing it though? How, what can you take from them that you could bring to you? Mm -hmm. And it's really incredible when people do that, they are able to make massive change in their life. And the reality is, is that like, 
most everything we do in life, we learn from somebody else. We emulate someone else. When you're learning how to drive a car, you spent many years before actually behind the wheel, sitting next to it, looking at it, watching how they do it, mm-hmm. whether they were yelling at the person next to them or being peaceful or not. It's a whole different story, but we watch that when we go to co- learn how to cook, you are next to someone cooking. You see that. So it makes sense to like, that it would be easier to see someone else and be able to emulate that. That yeah. makes sense to me, but we actually have to do the thing. And what happens is we see that and we actually don't take on. We're like, oh, that's for them. That's mm-hmm. not for me. Mm-hmm. Speaking of taking action, one of the things you you preach on your show is taking messy action, which is something that uh, obviously rang true for us when, when we heard that. So talk about that, that messy action, the, the failing forward, all that thing, all those things you have to just do. You have to just take those steps and do those things to make those dreams and goals happen, right? Oh my gosh. So this happened because I'm like, like I was a perfectionist as a child. Like it was like debilitating perfectionism, overachiever. Hi, I'm a firstborn raised by two firstborn. So like, <laughs> <laughs> right? like there's a lot there. Yeah. And all I learned was that like, even when something was perfect, which is all so contextual, it was in that moment. And the next day you got to do it all over again, right? Like it's only perfect for that moment. It's mm-hmm. not like you, you get to like ride that wave of perfection. You got to start again. And I also learned that every time I did something so perfectly, A, it like kind of like went out with like, it went out into the world without any impact celebration whatsoever. I, I poured all this into it, but people don't see the blood, sweat and tears behind Mm -hmm. the things that you're doing. And they often don't realize that you spent 17 hours making that Instagram post. Like (laughs) they just don't. And so really what I had to learn was that like, just getting the things out, just doing the thing even if it didn't make it out or it didn't actually do what I wanted to do, there was so much more feedback to the thing I could actually get. I could see that, oh, people like it when it's like this. Oh, it actually resonated more like this. And I could actually start to learn from it and faster. And so by no Mm -hmm. longer letting myself be um, impacted, impeded by having everything perfect before it like left my inbox and just doing the best I could in that moment. I learned so many things faster. The needle in the business moved so much faster. And like, even my podcast, like I took messy action. I'd never interview people like on air. I was like, I've done some Instagram lives. I think I could do this, you know, and the audio, we had this fancy mic and you know, it didn't even fucking work. Like the <laughs> first six episodes, like the, it's like, it's like, I'm talking to a mic. You can see there's a mic there. It's yeah. not working, oh, but like the reality is, is that those are just the first six episodes and it's better for them to get out there. And then I learn from that. Then I like wait until I'm a perfect interview with the perfect everything. Like, so I'm just a big fan of that. It's so hard for people to do, but it's very freeing. Once you do it and you realize, Oh, I didn't die. No one got hurt. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I actually was able to learn something to make the next step boom, you'll start to just take more and more messy action. And you'll see that you actually can have the life you want to live. You can literally be it till you see it in that messy action. So let's talk about, you've sort of hinted at your, your childhood and and upbringing and and all that. Let's talk about how you got to where you are. I mean, you you mentioned being an overachiever has, has being good and and successful at things sort of always come naturally through the hard work that you put into it, or or was that a, a bit of a learning curve? Oh, I, um, yeah, I, I, I was a straight A student always. I think my first B I ever got was, it's so shocking because I'm a applies instructor, but my first B was in PE because <laughs> I couldn't do, because I couldn't do 10 perfect pushups. Never mind that they didn't actually teach you how to do a pushup. They just said, do them. Right. But anyways, so like I, um, I love that you're hanging on to that anger still. Like, I know. Oh, oh you, Mr. You Free. could have taught me. I know. I know this name. <laughs> I know where he lived, everything like, yeah. So anyways, but I, I think I think it was a survival mode for me. I don't know that it was actually like, like my parents weren't all, like always on top of me. It has to be perfect, but there was a level of like, you are the oldest child. You are the role model for these two as a four-year-old, yeah. you know? So <laughs> I'm, I'm flashing like, to what I tell my oldest daughter right now. Oh my God, I'm failing. Yeah. So, so I like, I remember getting in trouble because they didn't do their part of the chore. I didn't do yeah. my chores because they didn't do their chores because yeah. I had to do what after them. And they're like, well, you should have done it for them. And I'm like, what in right. the world? So uh, I think the perfectionism and overachievers was just like survival mode. Like, how do I like get through the day without being in trouble? And that is its own thing. And I, I don't think I need, my parents do not need to be blamed for everything about that, <laughs> because it was also just, 
I am a words of affirmation is a love language. And so when you get straight A's and your teachers talk to you and you have hundred percent, like those things, like you crave that kind of attention. And so that's kind of how I lived my life as an athlete. That's how I lived my life as a student and it all the way. And even through college and all this stuff until it got to, as an adult running my own business, what I realized is that like being a perfectionist and overachiever was costing me money mm. and it was costing me my health and it was costing me like living my life because I was like, just, it had to be a certain way. And I was so high strung about that. And so once I like put a blog out with grammar errors and nothing, no one came for me, um, I was like, oh, no one is, no one is actually coming to you and saying, you know what, that email you sent was so perfectly written. They're not saying right. that they're saying, wow, when you said this, it changed my day. So I had to start to like reframe what that was, but yeah, childhood, I was like a little adult <laughs> walking around trying to be perfect with everything. Right. <laughs> tell me, tell me more about that struggle that you mentioned, the, the health problems and all the, all the things that mm -hmm. weighed you down. What, what was that experience like? Because I was so high strung and stressed out about making everything very perfect and trying to be a certain way I caused, and this is something that people, I, a lot of people listening probably are going through this and no one's talking about it. I actually ended up with stomach issues that were slowly killing me because what happens is when you are so stressed out, you stop going through digestion. I mean, you stop going through digestion, you stop going through sleep. And then it's a vicious cycle. If you're not sleeping, you're not digesting because the two things work together on the same part of the brain. Mm -hmm. So I then stopped absorbing nutrition. So here I was like eating all the healthy foods, taking all the things and like nothing was sticking. And so I'd gotten to uh, 20 pounds lighter than I am now. It does not like, I, although in LA, they love that on, on a girl. It did not look good on me. It did not <laughs> feel good. Um, I felt ill, tired, exhausted all the time. And when I finally found someone who would listen to me and actually do some blood tests and realize what it was, it came down to, I have to watch my stress and I have to get my sleep back on board. And when I got those two things going, then I could start, start absorbing nutrition again. And so yeah. all the fancy foods I was buying at Whole Foods was actually absorbing the nutrition from right, it. Right. And it started to allow me to have more energy when you have more energy, you have a lot more positivity and abilities and, and dreams in life. And so what I really try to get people at is like you, you trying to do everything in such a certain way and hold yourself in such a high strung way is actually, it's not just your attitude that's being affected. It's not just the people around you have to deal with your like high strongness, your actual cellular level is taking all that on. And over time, it's going to kill you. It will. Like I, I, the guy who looked at me, like, he's like, I don't know how you're standing in front of me right now. You should be asleep in bed. You don't have, you don't have the nutrition to get up every day. That obviously that is a glaring example of why self-care is so important. And yet yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, all of us put it near the end of the list of all the things that we need to do. And somebody I was working with the other day, shared the, the champagne fountain analogy, right? Like if you fill that, that top champagne glass that's on the tower, it overflows and fills all the cups below it while the rest of us run around filling up the bottom and hoping there's going to be enough left at the top by the time we get there. This is the best analogy I've ever heard. Isn't it incredible? I'd, I'd never heard amazing. it until like two weeks ago. I was like, oh my God, all of a sudden, like I've heard this, I've, I know it, it's a part of my being, but that visualization, I was like, that's incredible. So, I mean, that paints a picture, your story paints a picture, but if, if you can just say more about why self-care is so important and why it, it is something that should be foundational to every day of your life. Yeah. So, I mean, what I love about that analogy is like champagne is such a cel celebratory like event. Like, right. you know what I mean? There's something so exciting about it. Whereas like the air mask analogy from the airplane makes just yeah. like everyone's going to die. So well, I'm and it's totally that negative, right? Like you're, you're, you're going to die if you don't do this thing, but there's also this, like, you can also just have like this really awesome experience if you do this. Yeah. So the reason why self-care isn't selfish and also like I'm, I, I have been, I had interviewed someone on my podcast and I was like, when I was talking to him, like, we have to, we need a new word for selfish because selfish has such a negative word. And yes, there are selfish people in the world, but like you actually wanting to take care of yourself, that's not selfish. It's actually love. If you do not take care of yourself, if you are running around, just filling up everyone's glass <laughs> just all the time, like what's going to happen is you are crazy. You're exhausted. You're, you're going to resent everybody around you because they're asking for more. 
And you're like, I haven't even filled my class at the top yet. Mm -hmm. I'm just been filling yours. Well, they don't know that when we have resentment towards others, it's because we've broken a boundary, not someone else. We've yeah. broken one yeah. of our boundaries. And so for me, I don't recall going, oh, thank gosh, my parents were so exhausted, stressed out. And like, just because they took care of me so well, that's not why, like, that's not a memory, right? right like the right. memories that I have are like, that I want to keep are when I, when they were going to the gym and walking and happy and excited, and then they had energy to take us to do things, mm -hmm. they had energy to share time with us. And so what I think is so important and why people need to get self-care as a priority, number one, they fill their gas tank first, they fill their champagne glass first, is you are not on this planet to like run around and get exhausted and die. Like you're just not. And the people around you actually want to experience you. They want to hang out with you, the person that they love. So you can't be that person if you're exhausted and putting yourself third or last. Like very few people are putting themselves second. If they have kids, kids are first. If they have a job, then the job's there. If they have a spouse, maybe the spouse ends up third. <laughs> right. So then where are they on this list? And so it's no wor no wonder that people are just running around stressed out and tired, but it's like, I know for a fact, cause I see it with the people that I teach and I coach when they get even 15 minutes of movement in for themselves, they get their priority in first, they have energy, love, excitement, joy for everybody. You're so much more generous. Mm -hmm. If your cup is overflowing, you're like, yeah, take that. Yeah, you can do. It. Oh yeah, I can do that. If your cup is like barely full, you've got nothing left. Someone bumps into you. Of course you're going to yell at them yeah. because you're like, that was the last of my champagne, right? Like you're <laughs> going to be so upset. But like, just notice who you are when you're floating at the top and your cup is filled. You just have so much more ease, energy, excitement, joy, love to give. So I hear the people listening to the show and hearing that and going, gosh, that sounds good, but I have a job to get to and kids to feed and a wife to take care of and the lawn to mow and paint the house and all the things. Where do you mm -hmm. fit it in? How, how, what does self-care look like for you? Yeah. So, um, first of all, I totally understand that my husband and I run three businesses together. So <laughs> You I'm know. sure there's nothing but peace and harmony. What could I, go wrong? Right. And and he's a night owl and I'm a morning person and we have three dogs and that are well trained and don't listen. So <laughs> the, I get it. Um, here's the thing. One thing that I would say is you don't have to do it all. Like remember the overachievers and isn't going to work for you. It did not work for me. It sent me into a nice little health situation. So what is, what can you do for five minutes for you? Just five. Just five minutes for you that day. And maybe that's sitting at the edge of your bed with the light off meditating when you get up, right? Maybe that is while you're brushing your teeth, you're telling yourself some amazing things about yourself. Maybe while you are doing the laundry, you put some music on to dance, but like, what can you do for yourself right now with the life you have? Then what happens is you get more energized. You have more excitement. You have more joy. Just a little bit it was a long way. So then you can actually start to your eyes and ears look for what your brain wants to do. So you start to look for where there's little gaps in there where maybe you could actually ask for help. So maybe you are married and have kids and have the lawn to mow, but can you go, Hey, to your spouse, it'd be really awesome. If on Mondays before dinner, I could have 20 minutes to myself to go do this thing. Is there a day of the week where I could take care of everything for 20 minutes for you? And then all of a sudden you each have 20 minutes. Now imagine what happens. So I think what we have to do is stop thinking it has to like, we have to switch the schedule to being perfect. You have to do is like test out the waters. What is it you need? And then just make sure the people around you understand what you're trying to do. Hey, I'm really trying to get five minutes of intentional movement in my life every single day. Okay, great. Once you put that out there and you do it, then you can celebrate with your kids. You can celebrate with your family. And then all of a sudden that five minutes can become seven minutes. And all of a sudden it's 10 mm -hmm. minutes. And so I think we just have to, Something it's all or nothing. And then the other thing is like, nobody actually asked you to be a martyr. No one did. Yeah. All right. No one, you're doing that because you think you doing all the things in your house is what will make people happy. But have you ever asked them what will make them happy? There, you'd be surprised. And as your kids get older, they can do things. They can actually do some laundry. Maybe they'll ruin it. It's going to be okay. It's just <laughs> gloves. Start again. But you know, like there's also some other things like I, when my husband and I got together, I had a housekeeper for a studio apartment. And he's like, you have a housekeeper for a studio apartment? <laughs> I said, yeah, she comes every week. And he's like, I don't think we need that. I can clean this house. And I was like, you can do whatever you want, but she's coming every week. And he had a really <laughs> hard time with this, right? He just really had a hard time. So when we moved, from, but then he got used to it. He's like, oh, wow, it is so nice to have this like clean house. And I was doing calls while she was doing it. I'm like, yeah, you were working, you were getting stuff done. So I know that that sounds like a luxury, but like 
if you think about how much you make for an hour of your time, and then you look at the things that you have to do that do not bring you any joy, they bring you none. Okay. Then I would ask yourself who can do this for less than what I get paid. And they, that brings them joy. And then you'd you be surprised. Now you're giving money to people in the community to do something you don't like. You have this extra hour on your hand to go make more money, spend more time with your family, just be a happier person, which means you're going to have more and happier people just don't go like spending all the money on the world. They're like, they're like just enjoying the scenery around them. And you've given back to the people in your community. So it's really awesome. So I think like, I know that can sound like a luxury. I know everyone's like inflation. There's a, maybe a recession coming out, whatever. Here's the deal. I promise you, you might have an extra 20 bucks you can give to someone to do your grocery shopping for you. I pro- like, or to pick up the dog poop for like, just think about it. Like, look at the things you have to do and just ask yourself, where can I invest in someone else to help me out with some extra time? And if you just start with one thing and then you see how it goes and you test it, I promise your life will change. It really, really will. And then you're helping other people do things that bring them joy. It's, it really is an investment in yourself. We see it as buying a luxury or buying this thing that, oh, what are the neighbors going to think when the house cleaner comes and, and all these things that we attach to it. And, and it really is an investment in your happiness because all of a sudden you have this freedom to move and do the other things that you one day you'll make time mm-hmm. for and whatever. And I think the same can be said for, and, and I'm sure you're going to echo this as a coach, but it, having a coach, having somebody who's been down the road before you on wh- whether it's a professional thing, a fitness thing, a nutrition thing. I can tell you after 45 years of trying to figure out what the hell to eat, I still have no idea what the hell to eat. So I, <laughs> I'm going to go talk to somebody and say, uh, you know, I've been guessing and I'm doing okay, but you know, I would like to just, I, I'm done guessing. I want someone to just tell me, put this in your face and then go do the rest of your things <laughs> because you just, you, you end up doing these gymnastics in your head all day of, Oh God, how, how does my body feel? It's been an hour since I ate that thing. Do I feel okay? Like I just, uh, how much yeah. time am I wasting when, that I could be using in more productive ways? So So talk to me about coaching and why coaching is such a a valuable tool for somebody who's trying to take care of themselves. First of all, I, yes. And I, I think it's, I think there's a reason to try to do things on your own. And I think that at some point you need to figure out like there are other people out there who are educated and they love doing it. Mm -hmm. And when you invest in yourself in different ways, hiring different people, you actually pay attention in a different way. Mm -hmm. You really do. Like they say, whatever you pay for, you pay people who pay, pay attention. And so there's also all like, don't go, Oh, that's like a nutrition coach is so expensive. Maybe not. Maybe mm-hmm. there's a student going through their program who would freaking love for you to be their, their trial person. Like mm-hmm. there are ways of getting things. There's also such a thing as legal bartering, it's not trading, it's like legal bartering. So you give a service to them for a certain price. They give a service to you. You write a little contract, you write it off. Right. So there's these things. So please don't, as you hear me say this, do not go. That's for someone else. It's not for me. There are ways and if people who really want to make things happen, they move mountains. So just keep that in mind. But for me, I love coaching people on what I'm an expert in because I remember what it was like to not have those answers and how long it took me and how long it cost me to figure these things out. And so when I hired someone who was a few steps ahead of me, they helped me out. Then after I got to the next level, I hired someone who was a few steps ahead of me again. And mm-hmm. what's so cool is then you're not wasting time, which AKA is money <laughs> that you mm-hmm. say you don't have on thing on things that don't work and you also have someone to talk to and you have to like you literally say like I did this and they can go oh that is an interesting puzzle piece by the way do you know you said that last week you just have someone else to help you recognize the patterns that you have mm-hmm. and so i i think like i wish that I wish there's a few things that are raised as children. One of them is be it till you see it as a, uh, as like a thing to do. Like, how does that person do it? Okay. Now you break that down and you do it. And the other thing is like, it is not a luxury, nor is it anything to be like ashamed of that you hire out support in areas that you don't know the answer. It's actually like the smartest thing to do. Look at athletes. You don't, there's not a single professional athlete that we all look up to. That's like, you know what? I coached myself. Right, right. <laughs> I got the Olympics on my own. No one helped me hit here. <laughs> uh, there was some, I want to say it was a stand-up comedian. I saw a bit the other day and they were talking about the idea that you go through, you know, 12 years of high school with teachers who are essentially coaches. And then, you know, some of them go to college and you pay coaches to teach you things. And then one day somebody says, okay, go get a job and live your life. G- good luck. There's there's no more coaches. Now you're on your own. And then we spend, I don't know how many years going, why can't I figure this out? Why is my life so hard? Why is this so difficult? Because there's nobody coaching you. So if yeah. you, and it, I'm, not, I'm not even saying that you have to go hire a coach, but 
just connect with somebody who is a few steps ahead of you. Be part of a community of people that are a few steps ahead of you. Look at who your friends are. If they're all in kind of the same boat and dragging you down and you're all just commiserating with how much life sucks, maybe find a different community, maybe find some different friends. But, but I think that so much can be learned from just connecting with people that have been down the road before you. That is amazing and well said. And also like y'all are listening to this as a podcast. So if you don't think you can afford coaching right now, go listen to the podcast of the person you wish you could hire. Mm-hmm. A ton of the stuff that they're saying on their podcast, they say to the people who pay them, yep. by the way, they don't have like a different script. So like you can, now you have to do the due diligence. You're going to have to have a figured accountability of sorts for yourself. Maybe you're like writing reviews into them saying, Hey, I tried that thing you said on this podcast, like figure that out. But like, there are ways to get coaching. Like I interviewed someone on my podcast and she said, Oh, JLo is my mentor. She doesn't know it, right. but she's my mentor. I look totally. to her. I look to see what she's doing and she's my mentor. So like give yourself permission to play around with that and then really like dive in on someone. And then as you can, like put money aside until you can invest in the actual coach. But like, there's nothing wrong with like actually having people around you that are a little bit more ahead of you in the same area. And there, you don't have to feel like weird. Like, Oh, why would they want to be friends with me? One of my best friends is a trillion dollar strategist. That's mm-hmm. her job. She wow. helps strategize trillion dollar companies, employment, right? Why is she friends with me? I make her laugh. <laughs> right. So I I make her laugh. I listen to her. I help her for a scene. And then in exchange, sometimes she answers a question I have. That's freaking awesome. So it like is. you just have to, I think, um, what all, the next per, the next thing they're saying is like, okay, you two, thanks so much. But I how do I break up with my best friends? I'm not saying that, but you might have to put them on pause for a month. Mm-hmm. We started by talking about be it till you see it. And for somebody who's out there hearing this and going, gosh, this all sounds awesome. How do I do it? Where do you start? Give me a couple of quick things I can do today to start being it till I see it. Okay. First, you need to know who you want to be. So I just need you to like, take a moment and picture yourself. It can be one year from now. Like, who do you, how, where do you want to be living? How do you want to be showing up? What job are you doing? Like give yourself a per a picture of you in that moment. And then I actually want you to go, okay, what's the first next step? Right. So let's say you want to be making $150,000. $150,000. Okay. So then the first next step would be maybe you have to look for a different job, or you maybe have to look for jobs that pay that much, or maybe you have to learn how to balance your checkbook. <laughs> maybe you have to review your expenses. So for everyone, it's a little bit different that first next step is, but the first step is who is it that you want to be? And then we can actually work backwards onto what that person does. So you can have little roadmap stepping stones to get yourself there. So much great advice here. We didn't even get into the Pilates or the breath work or all of the things that you offer as a, as a coach and a teacher. So where can we learn more about you and everything you do online? Oh, well, aside from the Until You See It podcast, um, you can go to onlinepilatesclasses.com if you're looking for Pilates. And um, if you're like, oh my God, that is the scariest thing in the world. Great, you need it. So, but let me de- break it down for you because it's a lot easier than one thinks. Um, and if you want to uh, find me on social media, I'm at leslie.logan on Instagram. And my team has me on all the things, but that's where I like to hang out. Our thanks to Leslie Logan. She's a certified Pilates and mindset coach and the host of the Be It Till You see it podcast you can find links for her and her work in the show notes for this episode at the fitmess.com you know i i really enjoyed that interview i know for me personally being the anxious body that i am i am constantly in fear of moving into the whatever it is I'm, i want to move into even just like the acting as though i am already that person and doing the things it's terrifying sometimes But it's those times when I actually push through and I make myself do that, where like this immense amount of growth just happens. And then I really do become that person. How much imposter syndrome does that create for you when you do that? Is is there a point during that sort of faking it part where you're like, oh, I'm so full of shit? I think early on, like once I started doing that, once I started taking that risk, because it really is a risk Mm -hmm. to some extent, right? Um, Even within our brain, you do get used to it. But then you start to figure out that, you know, I am capable of new things. I am capable of growing beyond what I am today. And you start to understand that and it becomes more comfortable. So, I mean, in the early days when I started doing it, I was like sweating bullets whenever I was like giving a presentation or addressing a group of people in some kind of authoritative capacity that I'd never done before, Mm -hmm. you know, and then like walk away and throw up. 
Like <laughs> it was really nerve wracking, but now today it's just like, okay, I've done this a hundred times before. I'm smart. I'm intelligent. Whatever it is I'm trying to grow into, I can get there and I can do the things and it's not a problem. I'm going to make it. It's not going to be a problem. And I don't know. It just, it, it gets more natural over time. Mm -hmm knowing that as a human being, you're capable and you're able to do these things. And I, and I like that you made the analogy about speaking in front of people, because that's literally what she talked about is if, if you want to be the person speaking on a stage, don't wait until 30,000 people are waiting to hear from you. Go to the mm -hmm. coffee shop and talk to five, do, do the reps, you know, do the work. You got to get in the practice. And that's where, you know, I think that speaks to her other main point there is just about taking any messy action. It's okay to do it and to fuck it up and to learn from it and do mm -hmm. better next time. Like, because you can sit here all day and, and do nothing and think about it and wonder and worry and, oh, what if, what if, what if it goes, what if people laugh? What if it's terrible? What if, what if nobody shows up? Whatever the thing is. But unless you take some action, you'll never know and you'll just be paralyzed in that fear. And so I, I, I really just appreciated that point that no matter what changes you're trying to bring to your life, whatever elephant bite you're trying to take, it's okay if it's messy and that you, that you mess it up because you'll learn from it and you'll get better next time. And eventually you will become that person you're trying to become. Yeah. And one of my, one of my favorite authors, Lee Cockrell, he's, he was a, an executive vice president at Disney for all of Disney world. Just amazing guy. He, he has all kinds of like executive management tips and tricks. I heard him say once that like, Whenever you're making a decision, whenever you're choosing to do something, just ask yourself if you can reverse that decision. You know, something so like in his world, right? Like, you know, changing sheets once every two days instead of every day. You can reverse that, right? If people don't like it. Yeah. Whenever I'm in that situation where I need to kind of step up, I really do ask myself, if I do this and I fail, is this something I can reverse or is this going to kill me? Is it going to get me fired? Is it going to destroy my family, like something like that. Yeah. And if it's none of those things, if this is something I can easily reverse and back out of, why wouldn't you? Yeah. And that always makes it a little bit easier for me. That just, I mean, just a quick story. That was when we moved to Canada, that was one of the deciding factors is we just went, we can move and it can suck and we can come back and it's okay. It's, it's a year, it's two years, it's whatever, our, you know, amount of time it works out to be. But that was one of the things we're like, yeah, what's the harm, right? Okay, mm -hmm. we won't move back to the same house, but we can move back to the same neighborhood and the same people and all the things. So yeah, that, that is a, a fantastic measuring stick is whatever the decision is, whatever, whatever the thing is you're trying to do, if it doesn't work and you want to scrap it, that's okay. It's okay mm -hmm. that it didn't work out. There, there will be a lesson that you learned from it that you will be better off for having learned than for have, having sat there wondering what if. Speaking of decisions you can reverse, you should come join us in our Facebook group. It is a great place, great community, lots of things going on there. But if you don't like it, you can just leave. Like that's the beauty of it. You can reverse that decision. And you can find the link to join that group on our website at thefitmess.com. That's where we will be back next week with a brand new episode. Thanks for listening. Bye everyone. Oh, mixed it up. See, you changed it. I did. See everyone. Now I feel better. All right, complete. We know this podcast is amazing and doesn't seem to lack anything, but we need a legal disclaimer. Prior to implementing anything discussed in this podcast, it is your responsibility to conduct your own research and consult your physician. You should assume that Jeremy and Zach don't know what they're talking about, and they're not liable for any physical or emotional issues that occur directly or indirectly from listening to this podcast.